I'm standing here at the site of 1607 James Fort. I'm just inside the fort's west wall, and over my left shoulder you can see some crosses. Those crosses represent the first burial ground that the English had here, uh, and this burial ground does date to that first year of 1607. Now, we knew from the records that this uh, colony starts out with 104 men and boys, and by the end of 1607, more than half of them are dead. About two decades ago, we were working in this area behind me, and we came across over 30 grave shafts. Uh, many of these burials were underneath the foundations to a building with a cobblestone foundation uh, that we knew would, was one of these row houses that they referred to as being constructed in 1610, 1611. So, those grave shafts that we identified underneath that building's foundations, just basic archaeological principle, had to predate that building. Uh, not only that, but it did seem curious that they were burying their dead inside the fort. Well, one needs to only look to the Virginia Company of London records to see why that makes sense. Now, the Virginia Company sponsored this adventure, and of course they had a vested interest and keeping the colony afloat for as long as possible so it could return a profit on their investment. And one of their instructions that they laid out for the original wave of, of, of English was, above all things, do not let the Virginia Indians know your casualties. So what it all boils down to is the colonists were simply trying to hide the fact that they were weak from the Virginia Indians by burying their dead just inside the fort here behind me. Now there was no archaeological evidence that these burials had been marked. We simply marked them after we did the work so that the visitors can see where the burial ground was. Of course, if the colonists in 1607 were trying to hide these deceased, they would not, they would likely not mark the burials. Now, the vast majority of these colonists died uh, due to malnutrition and or disease in that first year and mostly during the late summer months uh, August and September. That being said there were uh, at least two uh, uh, colonists that we'd expect to be buried here that died uh, during combat with the Virginia Indians and one of whom we do believe we identified uh, back during our excavations in uh, 2004 and that was the burial of a young English boy, about 14 years of age, who was found in, in a grave shaft that ran parallel to the west wall here, not far from where I'm standing. Now the reason we believe this may have been one of the casualties of a, a, a skirmish with the uh, native Virginians was that we did identify a quartzite projectile point, our contact period native Virginian arrowhead, right up against the boy's left femur. He also uh, likely had damage to his clavicle or shoulder region that could have been from fighting or combat as well. Uh, now when you look to the records, not long after they arrived here in late May of 1607, the colonists have split up. One group with uh, Captain John Smith and many of the other leaders headed west to where the fall line is to explore. They took the two largest ships, the Susan Constant and the Godspeed. Here at Jamestown were the remaining colonists and the smallest ship, the Discovery. Now, the nearest uh, native Virginian uh, village were the, was the Paspahay village, which is only a few miles upriver here uh, at the confluence of the Chickahominy River and the James River. The Paspahay and their allies, numbering around 400 by the English accounts, were to kind of test the, the English colonists out. So uh, in late May, there was an attack on the remaining English here at Jamestown. Uh, during that skirmish, uh, three Virginia Indians lost their lives, and one English colonist, a young boy, according to the records, was killed. A few days later, they also note that another English colonist died from his wounds. Now, we do believe that the young English colonist that we found here was indeed that boy. We can't be sure who the boy was, although we are lucky that Captain John Smith did list the names of the majority of the first 104 men and boys, and in that list he has four boys. And one of those four boys, a Richard Mutton, does not show up in later documents, so there's a good chance that this is him.
We also found that the boy had a chipped tooth uh, that had happened uh, at an earlier age and that he had been fighting off uh, on again, off again infections throughout his youth. And that infection had led to heavy damage to his mandible or, or jawbone. Uh, it is likely that at some point that those infections uh, would have claimed his life uh, had he not died uh, during the skirmish with the uh, Paspahe. The boy's age was determined by an examination of the long bones that had not yet fully ossified or fused uh, and the fact that the boy's wisdom teeth had not yet uh, fully erupted. So the forensic analysis of the boy was done by forensic anthropologists from the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Uh, the team was led by uh, Dr. Douglas Owsley and Kari Brulhide, and they were the ones who were able to determine that this was indeed a boy through their analysis, and they've done uh, work on many of our burials, in fact I believe all of our burials just about since the inception of the Jamestown Rediscovery Project. So a big shout out to, to them and their work, uh, which has proved invaluable to our understandings of early Jamestown history. So we continue to learn more about this, this boy through studies of his dentition. Uh, we even know at what age that tooth chipped now. And uh, I'm sure we'll learn more going forward. So stay tuned. Uh, we may have another, another update at some time, uh, either on our website or through a, uh, a video like this one. Uh, now there is a link in the, in the notes section of this video to uh, a web page uh, dedicated to this uh, early James Fort burial ground.